Welcome to session five, where the focus is on Star Apollo Mapping System, a novel strategy for AF activation source mapping. For this session, we're going to review a case uh, myself and Richard recorded recently. Uh, before we start, I want to welcome back our panel, uh, Richard, Atul, and we will have uh, Musa join us uh, soon. Um, so um, we'll go on to the case. Uh, and I'll share my case here. If we can start the first um, slide deck there. Thank you. All right. So um, just to uh, kind of bring up uh, what star mapping is. Uh, star mapping is a technology that pretty much summarizes AF activation uh, during 30-second recordings. That's the simplified way of looking at star mapping. Now, Richard has a lot more to say about it. But this is uh, what my takeaways are from what star mapping does. What, what can it do? It can um, show you activation patterns. Uh, it can show you sites of uh, localized activation. And while it does this, what does it ignore? It ignores low voltage and SCAR. It uh, ignores uh, infrequent phenomena. Uh, and recordings that are too short or, cath or where the catheter is unstable or has poor contact. And errors of timing interpretation are uh, overwhelmed by repeating uh, patterns. So how does it um, uh, do this? So it takes the 3D geometry from the case, and it is able to show you where the location of the recording and the electro electrodes are. Uh, it is able to show you the dominant activation patterns, uh, which are shown in this uh, kind of purple arrow. And it's able to show repetitive sites of uh, local activation, which are shown as these uh, bright red uh, spheres. Uh, recording and electrode numbers and other characteristics can also be uh, available if you want and if you ask for it uh, with just a, a mouse click. So what does that, what does the, what do these sites mean? So early sites of activation is what it means. It, it, these are highly repetitive sites with early uh, activation emerging within the footprint of the uh, mapping catheter, uh, such as that you can see this activation uh, spread in all directions within your mapping catheter. For example, when you have the grid catheter, you see the activation spread within that grid catheter. And uh, the early sites of activation are ranked according to the repetition count, and they're represented by these red spheres. And the larger the sphere, the more repetitive it is and the more um, active, earliest uh, it is uh, within the activation uh, platform. What do you mean with uh, repetitive pat patterns of activation? Uh, these represent a summary of the two most dominant directions of activation wave uh, through the footprint of the mapping catheter as well. And this is recorded, as I said, during that 30 second recording. Uh, these are represented by the purple arrows. Um, again, they've made the system very intuitive uh, with the arrows and the spheres. Um, and the thicker the arrows are, the more repetitive uh, it is. And these uh, repetitive patterns of activation um, helps us identify the direction of potential AF sources uh, that we might not pick up with just the early sites of activation. So um, I want to present uh, our case uh, that we got to uh, do together. Uh, and it was, it was truly my privilege to have Richard uh, come over from London to Jonesboro, Arkansas to do this case with me. So is a 78 year old female with uh, CAD and PCI, had hypertension, diabetes, so a lot of uh, risk factors. She had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, had a pulmonary vein isolation uh, with radio frequency catheter ablation in uh, 2011. Um, and, and she'd maintained uh, sinus rhythm with antiarrhythmic therapy. And I'll say that at that time, we used the lasso-based ablation strategy. Uh, it was uh, putting a lasso catheter and going around the lasso and ablating around the lasso. Um, she did have recurrence of atrial fibrillation in 2020, um, and she was started on Sodalol at that point. Um, she ends up having recurrence of persistent atrial fibrillation uh, in December of 2022. And despite high doses of Sodalol and Amiodrone and failed cardioversions, uh, she um, she stays in atrial fibrillation. Um, she ends up having a worsening ejection fraction and decompensated heart failure, which is something that we see in these patients quite a bit. And at this point, she's uh, referred for uh, a repeat uh, AF fibrillation. And I want to take a moment and uh, do our poll here, uh, if possible, uh, before we go on to our, our, our case clip. Um, so I want to just kind of... Uh, 
ask the audience what their thoughts are with our poll question. Um, for a repeat AF ablation procedure, um, what is your treatment strategy uh, currently? Are you doing PVI plus uh, cafes? Are you doing PVI plus lines? Are you making a combination of lines and cafe along with the PVI? Or uh, is deciding the lesion set uh, a, a more of a challenge and more has to be more customized? Um, so please vote on this uh, poll question and uh, I'll go forward in uh, with the case presentation and we'll come back to the answers of the poll. So Richard and Atul, feel free to jump in um, as, as we're doing this uh, case uh, and comment along. Um, and, and I'm assuming Musa is gonna join us soon as well. But here you can see we're doing a, a baseline voltage uh, mapping. Um, and you'll, you'll see that um, as we're moving, this is actually using the Insight X system and the grid catheter. Uh, and that's what the star mapping system is uh, 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 integrated with uh, uh, for its use. And so you, 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 we collect uh, our baseline voltage mapping. You'll see as we are looking at the uh, um, voltage uh, that this is a very, uh, what I would call more of a PV still isolation, um, kind of how we used to do them uh, a long time ago, not the routine antral isolation that we uh, we do now. Um, yeah, but it's surprising as, as we've seen in the earlier sessions and we talked about how um, sometimes PV isolation is all the patient needs and the patient actually did really well for a, a, a very long time and um, obviously now is in, in a different state. And um, any thoughts on, um, on, on, on what our poll question was before as, we, as, as you watch the, the, the mapping being performed here? I don't have any particular thoughts on the poll question. Um, you know, uh, I, maybe a, a none of the above might have been a, a, a nice option as well, because uh, I'm not sure that that we necessarily know what we're doing. But um, you know, it's it's very interesting to me as I'm watching you collect this sinus rhythm map that the voltage. Uh, outside of the veins seems pretty normal, um, especially given the presentation. You said she came back with persistent AF, heart failure, uh, decreasing ejection fraction. And, you know, it just goes to show how, you know, uh, we still understand so little about the substrate of AF and and you know the clinical presentation because if you'd asked me to guess what her sinus rhythm map would have looked like, I would have thought it's just diffusely <laughs> diseased, and I see a lot of purple there. Yeah, so, so this is a this is an AF map actually. Um, the voltage uh, gradients are pretty low; it's at 0.15. Um, uh, okay, just, all right. Just, okay, at, so. we're, we're speeding it up a little bit. So sorry about that. I should have told you. It's, it's at a it's at a five times speed that we're we're doing the map, and uh, okay. that, that is a, a great point. We'll see the sinus map at the end, uh, but what what you're seeing here is uh, we're now starting to do the what we call the star mapping. And Richard, feel free to jump in uh, as we do this. But the idea is that you collect your uh, pre voltage, you create the shell um, of the and uh, of the atrium, and then you identify. Uh, different areas with the grid, um, and you you sit still for 30 seconds, which I think was I think Richard saw was the hardest thing for me to do is sit still for 30 seconds. But you can see on the timer on the bottom, it tells you that uh, you kind of hold the catheter in place, allow the system to collect uh, the 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 patterns within the grid for that 30 second window, and you're going to multiple sites. Um, and I, I'm kind of doing it in a, a little systematic approach uh, uh, within the anterior wall, going to the posterior wall, um, coming along the antrum of the, um, uh, the, the, the pulmonary veins, the base of the appendage there, uh, and, and kind of systematically collecting about 15 sites or so um, and letting the system take the time uh, getting that data within the Insight X system at this point. Um, any thoughts on the mapping uh, aspect here, Richard, that I missed? Yeah, so, yeah, well, the, um, so I think it's important 
uh, for the audience to remember that where the map is based on the unipolar electron timings, there's no filtering or secret processing. And what we're really doing is showing the patterns of activation based on those unipolar electrograms. And if you remember the old studies of Alessi um, look, using epicardial arrays on, on surgical patients, how long it took uh, Mich Michel de Groot to, to um, analyze those data just for a few seconds by hand, it's an incredibly time-consuming process. And as we get more data endocardially from things like the grid, it's becoming humanly impossible to really assimilate all the data. So what we're really trying to do is to give you a summary of what's been happening for the last 30 seconds. And because it's recorded for a reasonable length of time, patterns that repeat themselves become more and more obvious. And unlike current vector of opposition that are shown on some of the maps, which are just showing you the vector in real time, um, we're showing you a summary of what the vectors and the activations have been doing over a longer period of time. And the, the hypothesis being that if something's repeating itself over and over again, it'll come out and you'll be able to see roughly the area of the atria that it's emerging or originating from. And therefore you can then cluster your lesions. So this system is not uh, it's blind to mechanism. It just wants to know where the location of the activations are emerging from. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, when I was, uh, it's interesting because if I start looking at cafes and it, obviously in AF, it's, it's very hard, but when you go back and look at some, when I look back at the cases that we did, what I would have thought of areas as early sites is not what I saw the system recognize. So it, I think there's definitely... The, the fact that the, you have AI involved uh, and makes this, makes it easier uh, that the human eyes don't process. Uh, I think that's I think, the beauty to me. Yeah, it's a good point because cafes, we don't know whether cafes are an origin with a very fast activation or they're created by a collision of wave fronts and are passive. And so what we're really trying to do is distinguish between those areas that look really interesting. Which ones are the ones pushing activation out? and which ones that have activation coming in towards them and colliding. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether we should uh, take a look at the audience poll and see what uh, uh, what the audience thought. And, and maybe you're right, uh, none of the above is is what uh, what we should go go for. Uh, it, it seems like, uh, you know, PVR plus lines kind of takes uh, takes the, the huge vote, but there there is a large majority of us that still have a hard time figuring out what to do. And I think uh, you're right, Atul, when we when we talked about whether we know what we're doing, I think outside of PVI, it's still a challenge for us to know. And I think that's kind of where I, I, I wanna highlight this uh, next uh, part of this uh, this video series to show uh, what the map showed us. Um, can we please go back to the, uh, the video here? Thank you, but I will go on. So Richard, here um, we're you... showing, um... go ahead, Atul. Go ahead and pause that. Oh, no, I, I, I was just going to say, you know, I'm glad that you chose to analyze the unipolar electrograms because, uh, you know, when we think about what's happening, ideally, we would love to see the action potentials, you know, and, and to really understand what's happening. That's not practical. Uh, but I think the unipolar activation uh, really gives us a better sense of what's happening at that MAP level uh, than the bipolar electrogram could ever give us. And, you know, in the bipolar, we can get very, very confused, especially in these cafe areas about what's really going on. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And uh, just uh, to talk about just the practical side of how this gets transferred. Um, we, the, the map, the, the, the data that's collected in the InsideX system is uh, transferred onto the STAR uh, mapping system and takes about 10 minutes for uh, Richard to give me his uh, STAR map, uh, which was uh, uh, incredible too. And uh, just a thought on that, Richard, I mean, is there, is there plans of making it more bi-directional, optimizing that workflow uh, a, a bit more um, where, you know, it's it's all one package. Uh, 
It's a great question. Or am I in trouble? I paid you to ask that question because we have, uh, yeah, we have a FDA submission in to um, take the data directly from an Ethernet cable live from Insight. So the map will update itself as we go along. So what will happen in the future is that you'll be able to then decide which direction you move your grid based on the RPAs and what they're pointing to. So it'll be live in uh, Q2 next year. Check yeah, in the post. that's great. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's play the video back up again. Um, so uh, here we are uh, uh, starting to see the star map here. And we're starting to look at early sites of activation and uh, the patterns of activation as well. And you can see um, we're highlighting some of these areas. Uh, here we are looking at the um, um, anterior septum along the right antrum, um, and also in the uh, in the anterior LA wall, you can see the the repetitive patterns. Uh, the two that are being highlighted that are kind of crisscrossing each other. Uh, we're seeing the early side of activation along the right uh, superior anterior um, uh, antrum. Um, and as we come into the uh, the posterior wall and along the posterior roof, especially along the right superior pulmonary vein, uh, we're seeing those early sites of activation again, but also uh, repetitive patterns of activation emerging from there in kind of both directions, which I think is also very interesting. Um, we're looking here along the base, along the uh, anterior base of the right inferior pulmonary vein. Um, again, seeing some of those patterns. So th these were kind of the patterns that we um, identified. Um, anything more on the star map, Richard, that you want to add along? Well, what, what was I think was really interesting is that this patient who had an osteal isolation still had a cuff of tissue around the outside of the vein, which you'd identified, and the activations are going into the vein. They're not coming out of the vein. So clearly those RPAs, you can see they're consistently pointing towards the vein rather than out. So the deep in the vein cannot be the source. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll talk about uh, doing a repeat PVI, but I think this is a great point that you made is the PVs were probably not the source. Um, and at this point, what you're seeing is uh, do is actually tagging these early sites of activation and these repetitive patterns of activation onto the end site map. Um, so you're taking those uh, points and, uh, you can you can clearly look at the where the catheter was at that point, pick up exactly which electrodes we need to tag. And what you're seeing there is uh, uh, my clinical team uh, taking those points and giving me uh, little markers, and they're marked in little green uh, dots. And once we have I, once we put those green dots in place, um, I'm kind of um, customizing my my lesion set. Um, I wanted to make, as as Richard said, it was a there was a pulmonary cuff there, so I wanted the right sided antrum uh, to be a little more wider. Uh, but I created the lesion set or drew the lesion set, incorporating the early sites of activation and the and those repetitive patterns um, within the uh, within my uh, target lesion set. And uh, we're using a Tactiflex uh, ablation catheter here. Um, and it's a single uh, transeptal technique, and we kind of had this discussion early on in in in, uh, in today's sessions. Um, I'm a single uh, a transeptal uh, axis person. I try to get my first pass isolation and then come back with the grid and, and check. Um, and, and I think there's obviously two ways of doing it. You can obviously have your grid in there as well. But um, we're applying 40 watts in the posterior wall. Uh, for about uh, uh, 10 to 12 seconds and about 50 watts in the anterior wall, um, more stacked lesions in the anterior wall um, as we are coming along um, uh, that anterior antrum. And, and I think I want to take a moment as we get to that uh, anterior septal area. This was one of the areas that we had identified that had a lot of early sites of uh, activation and also uh, some really interesting uh, uh, paths, especially with the signals going into the pulmonary vein there. Um, and so uh, the, the question is, how wide do you come in? And, and, you know, if you do decide the antrum, how do you decide your antrum? So to me, this is even for uh, a, a, a PVI alone strategy. Um, I know for this case, I used a redo case, but I would think that there's some value in assessing uh, where that PVI maybe need to be. Um, any thoughts on that? And, and, and before I miss that point here, you can see as we are in that area, uh, 
along that right superior, we actually convert to atrial flutter. Um, it's an atypical atrial flutter here. Um, and uh, you'll see we're, we're now doing the roof line uh, just because that we had that early sites of activation along the, uh, along the roof uh, in both the right superior area. Um, and as we finish that uh, roof line, um, uh, you'll see us uh, 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 terminate as well. But as we watch this map, uh, any other thoughts on, um, on the idea of incorporating this into a lesion set uh, that you kind of have in mind? Me, yeah, so maybe if I is. could... You go ahead, Russell. Maybe if I could just ask a question uh, to both Richard and, and Debbie. So are you just trying to incorporate those uh, red or orange dots, or are you also trying to incorporate the arrows? And and if so, you know, which arrows do you, do you kind of give preference to? So the arrows are an indicator of directionality only. So if you see arrows where the activation is spreading from one location in lots of other, you know, spreading away, then the arrows could indicate there's a region that activation is emerging from. So that's one of the things we look for. The early sites of activation could be a focal activation. It could be epicardial breakthrough. We, we, we don't, we're not able to distinguish. But if you see a red dot and arrows going away from it in both directions, that's a further encouragement that that may be another source of AF. Um, so in this situation, Debbie felt that the, I mean, our goal was always to try and do the minimum amount of ablation and leave the patient with as much natural atria as possible. And as we saw during the voltage map, their atria was very normal. And so Debbie's plan was to use the PVI that she wanted to do and also encompass those early sites of activation uh, within it. And it turned out that that's what organized the patient back into a regular tachycardia. And I think we talked about, you know, we talked about this before as well. You know, I, I'm, I'm more a minimalist when it comes to ablating in the atrium. I uh, try to do as much as I, I need to. And I think to me that was, uh, we, we pointed early that the voltage was normal. So I did not really want to do any more than what we needed. And uh, we did see those uh, activation patterns along the roof, which is why we did the roof line and we terminated uh, with, uh, with the roof line. And, and uh, we ended up doing a, a flutter line in this patient as well uh, because they had clinical flutter at one point. And uh, our final lesion set was ended up being uh, PVI, uh, which was a more wider, wider entry uh, coverage and then a roof line uh, which we showed that was blocked uh, using the uh, omnipolar mapping and then a, a CTI, which I, you know, which is probably not what I would have maybe done if I, if I had not had uh, had the mapping uh, tool. Um, and I'm, it's it's kind of you know I'm, I'm starting to realize that I probably need to have more input than just an atomical ablation, especially in in uh, some of these uh, redo cases. Um, and and just to kind of um, show some data. Um, don't want to take a lot of time on it, but uh, this is data from uh, Dr. Hannebrock and his group looking at um, uh, uh, outcomes, uh, long-term outcomes, comparing um, uh, just conventional therapy. And, and what they consider as conventional therapy is if you took persistent AF ablation patients and um, divided them to just de novo, uh, just de novo persistent AFs, and uh, going in for radiofrequency ablation, there was a PVI cohort, which was uh, which uh, uh, they looked at subgroup analysis. But the conventional group could either have PVI or cafes, PVI plus a line, or PVI plus cafe plus line, or they could have uh, ablation guided by star mapping. And, and you can clearly see from the, the graph that uh, the, the recurrence atrial of, from atrial arrhythmias was much uh, less with uh, when the star mapping technology was used in this patient population. And I think our, our um, at least our, our, our few experiences that we've had, uh, we've been able to utilize the technology to uh, get a very targeted approach in my mind, rather than uh, just an anatomical approach, especially uh, in patients that we uh, don't really have a substrate to go behind. Um, and um, just um, just my thoughts on it, I think to me, uh, the system uh, gives me a summary of uh, activation data. Uh, I think it helps design 
a, a, a more customized treatment plan, like like you saw in our case. Um, and, and like Richard said, it, it it doesn't make any assumption on arrhythmia mechanism uh, and does not prescribe any standardized treatment. I think it's up to the physician and the operator to look at those patterns, uh, look at the early sites, and then uh, look at the voltage and 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 kind of decide a, a, a better strategy for that patient uh, uh, rather than just taking an anatomical uh, 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 approach. Um, and I think uh, there's definitely uh, uh, future developments that are looking at looking at clinical outcomes. And uh, we are um, looking forward to being part of the study that's going to evaluate the, the STAR uh, technology um, for our redo population. Um, Richard, any, any uh, kind of final thoughts on uh, on the technology and uh, and Atul, I want to take your word as a final word uh, before we uh, wrap up this session. Well, I'm glad that Atul's going to finish because I'm a kind of disciple of his studies because I'm a great believer now that less is more, and um, I think that there's a sort of sweet spot where you do enough to stop the AF, you do more, and you're creating substrate and creating disease and making the situation worse. And I hope technologies like this will help us become much more focused and targeted. And I, I, again, I'm trying to move people away from the idea of AF termination, although it's an attractive thing. Uh, we mustn't chase termination. We must try and chase the most important uh, drivers, cardiovascular the patient, and allow the rest of the atria to recover. Um, and I hope that this will help to do that. Over to you, Atul. Yeah, you know, I, I'm glad that we haven't given up on mapping. Um, you know, uh, when we were having the earlier discussion on PFA and how we can just do lines and huge uh, swaths of the atrium, I think it's important to realize that we shouldn't dump all of the mapping knowledge and, and uh, understanding of atrial fibrillation that we've had before. So I really hope that you know, in the PFA era, we are not going to forget mapping. We are not going to forget how to be electrophysiologists and that we continue to use technologies like this one uh, to help us identify the drivers in atrial fibrillation. Well, uh, I, 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 I want to say thanks at all for... Uh... I mean, this is a great way to end our session. And I, I just want to take a minute to thank Atul for spending this time with us. And Richard, I last can't thank you enough for coming down and, and being part of the case and being part of the panel and, um, and uh, having this great discussion uh, for this tough case that we had. Um, before we close uh, today's I just, meetings, I just uh, want let's to take a you. quick look back. At Go ahead, Richard. I just you want to say something? Everyone. That day, Debbie did 15 cases. I mean, it's phenomenal going to Jonesboro and seeing her work. She did 15 cases that day and another 15 the next day, all AFs and complex devices. It's quite phenomenal to see her work. Well, thank you, Richard. You're very kind. But uh, before we close today's proceedings, let's take a quick look back at day one. <laughs>